In this video, I'm going to be talking about biliary interventions. Those are procedures performed by interventional radiologists to relieve blockages in your bile ducts. So these are a group of procedures where we go through the skin into the biliary system guided by imaging, and we can perform different things, including biliary drains, stents in the biliary system, balloon dilatation of the biliary system. We can also do what's called cholangioscopy. That's when we put a little camera inside the biliary system to take a look and potentially getting rid of stones or doing a biopsy. Those are all minimally invasive procedures that are performed through a pinhole. As you know, the liver is an organ that works by filtering the blood and excreting toxins through the bile. But the bile works not only by getting rid of toxins, but it's also an important digestive enzymes to take care of fat. As you can see in the pictures, the liver is a very large organ. It weighs about three pounds in a normal adult and excretes the bile through the bile ducts. You usually have a right bile duct and a left bile duct. They join together and they form what's called the common bile duct. The common bile duct measures about four inches or so and will dump the bile into the duodenum, which is the first part of the small intestine. There it will mix with the food coming out of the stomach and help digestion that way. Now, unfortunately, some people may develop blockages of the biliary system and they could be anywhere, but if you develop blockages, then the bile essentially cannot go out. And this will lead to jaundice, which is where your skin and your eyes turn yellow. At the same time, your urine may become dark like Coca-Cola and your stool may become pale like white. And that's because the excessive bilirubin in your blood gets then excreted in the urine, not as well as in the bile, and makes the urine dark. And the bilirubin is actually what gives the stool the normal brown color that we have. Now what causes blockages of the bile ducts? Probably the most common cause are biliary stones. Those are stones that get out of the gallbladder and go into the common bile duct. And when they block the common bile duct, usually at the ampulla of vata, which is the most narrow space at the distal part of the bile duct, then they will cause jaundice. Another common cause of jaundice is also cancer, and that's why this needs to be looked at very carefully. And most commonly, it's a pancreatic cancer, but it could also be a tumor that starts in the bile ducts called a cholangiocarcinoma. It could also be a tumor that starts in the ampulla of water, and that one's called an ampullary cancer. Or it could be a cancer that starts in the duodenum or organs around the duodenum and cause blockage of the bile ducts. That area is a very tight and busy area. Other less frequent causes of bile duct blockages are surgical injury, let's say after a cholecystectomy or some other upper abdominal surgery, and some scar tissue for some autoimmune diseases, for example, sclerosing cholangitis. Regardless of the cause of the bile duct blockage, they need to be relieved. And Surgery is not a very easy thing, not, it's not done everywhere, and it can be very complicated. So usually we prefer non-invasive ways to relieve the blockage if possible. Now, most of the time, this is done with a procedure called ERCP, which stands for Endoscopic Retrograde Cholangiopancreatography. And that's why an endoscopist, a GI doctor, usually places a camera through the mouth and they navigate through the stomach into the duodenum and they find the opening in the bile ducts and they are able to put a small catheter and inject dye into the bile ducts to see what the problem is and then they can remove stones or put a stent that way and that's usually the preferred method but it's not always possible to do. Sometimes the duodenum or the stomach may be blocked or they may not be able to find the opening for the bile duct. Or in some cases, if patients had a history of a gastric bypass, that makes a much longer wait for them to get in there and maybe impossible. In those cases, when the endoscopic approach is not doable, that's when you need a interventional radiologist to do a biliary procedure. Now, what does that entail? So like I started explaining before, we use ultrasound and x-rays to guide a small catheter through the skin, either through the right side or through the left bile duct, which goes right here. And we then navigate this small catheter, a very small tube, it's like a one to two millimeter tube, through the bile ducts. And we try to get all the way to the duodenum. And at the same time, we can inject dye to see exactly 
where the problem is and how we're going to treat it. And we then analyze the possible treatment options. We also collect some bile to send for cytology to check for cancer cells. And we can also send to microbiology to check for an infection in the bile to target antibiotics if needed. And actually in some situations, we can use a little camera that we insert through the same tube into the bio system. And we can look inside to see what the problem is. Is that a stone that is in there? Is that a cancer, a scar tissue, what it is? And using the camera, we can also do a biopsy, for example, or break stones. Now, there are a few types of different interventions that we can do in the biliary system. The most common initial step is, is usually to place what's called an internal external biliary drain. And this is a tube, it's a long tube that goes through the skin. It goes into a bile duct, and then we navigate this tube all the way through the duodenum. And there are holes in the proximal bile duct and in the duodenum, so the bile can drain either through the outside to a bag or through these holes from the bile system into the duodenum, which is the normal physiologic route. These are a great initial option, especially if there is a suspicion of an infection or the bilirubin room is very elevated because it allows us to monitor how much bile is actually coming out into the bag. They can also stay indefinitely if needed, although most patients prefer to get rid of them because they're a nuisance, basically. But they work really well. Now, if you have a cancer, for example, then we would prefer to put what's called an internal biliary drain. And we could do that right away when we do the first procedure. Or sometimes we put a biliary drain, let things get better, and then we come back and do a second procedure to put this internal drain so we can remove the external drain in the back. And this is essentially a stent similar to the stents we use in the heart and the arteries, usually covered with fabric that we can put inside the bile duct to relieve an obstruction and keep the bile duct open. The upside of those is then you don't need a bag, it always stays inside and it drains really well. The downside is that after some time, usually several months or a year or two years maybe, they may become clogged with debris and may require another intervention and then you're starting from scratch. The internal drains, they will drain internally through your duodenum and we can monitor the blood tests to make sure you're improving. Also, we can monitor the jaundice getting better and also the stool color but we don't have control of how much bile is coming out. It's not something we can, we can have immediate uh, feedback, basically. There's also an intermediate solution, which we don't use very often, but it's called an internal plastic drain, which is just a little tube that stays inside the bile duct and has holes on both sides and allow the drainage without being a permanent biliary stent instead of being a more permanent metallic stent. Although we're using less and less often because the newer metallic stents, they can be removed as well most of the time. Also the plastic stents, most of the time will require an ERCP to get them removed. And if they had trouble doing an ERCP in the first place, then it may be a problem to take them out. So we don't use them super often. And the third intervention would be the camera, which is called cholangioscopy. That's when we put a camera, we navigate through the system, and we can really look inside. Very helpful to see a stone. And then you can put a little fiber through the camera that has either laser or what's called shockwave. And you can break the stones so they can pass down into the duodenum. And we can also remove the stones with a basket. This camera also allows us to put a little tool that is a little alligator clamp. It's very small, but can take little bites of the tissue to do a biopsy if it's necessary. I know I talk about percutaneous interventions done by IR and ERCP done by GI doctors. And I explained that usually we prefer that the GI doctors do an ERCP first because it's usually an easier procedure. There's one situation that the interventional radiology procedure is best. And that's when you're, the obstruction is not in the lower part of the bile duct, but at the bifurcation. And that's a better location for interventional radiologists because for those cases, we'll need to get access in both the left and the right bile ducts and potentially put stents on both since the obstruction is right at the bifurcation. 
That's called a Klatskin tumor, and it's usually a type of cholangiocarcinoma, which is a tumor that starts in the bile ducts. And now here, I'm gonna give you some details about how these biliary interventions are done. They are usually done with sedation, but sometimes we do it with general anesthesia because that helps us control the movement of the liver. You probably don't know this, but the liver can move like two to five centimeters up and down while you breathe. And when you have general anesthesia, you can control the breathing a little bit, making it easier for us in some situations. Also, it may be more comfortable for the patient. But if a patient is very sick, potentially septic, we try to avoid general anesthesia and do it just with sedation. Those cases are usually easier because the bile ducts tend to be very dilated. We then guide the bio ultrasound, insert a needle into the bile ducts. Once we are in the bile ducts, we then inject a little bit of contrast to visualize the bile ducts. We then insert a wire in the bile ducts and over the wire, we can actually put a catheter. Then we can navigate through the bile ducts and see the anatomy better and get that wire and the catheter all the way into the duodenum. Once we have the wire and the catheter into the duodenum, then we can put a slightly bigger catheter to allow us to do procedures through it. And then we can decide if we're gonna put a biliary drain or a stent, or if we're gonna get the camera in to check inside. The important thing is when a patient has a biliary blockage, there's a high chance that that may be colonized with bacteria. And that's because whenever you have still water in the body, water that is not moving, it tends to grow bacteria. That's true for anywhere in the world. If you have a puddle of water, everybody knows it will get dirty. That happens in your body as well. So we tend to be conservative when we do a first procedure and try not to do too much. Sometimes we, the easiest thing is just to put a drain drain the bile, let the patient get better, and then at a later time, we can come back and do whatever other procedures are necessary. Now, what are the possible complications? Well, the two main complications of the procedure are bleeding, because you're going through the liver, there is a small risk of bleeding. It's not super high, it's relatively rare, but it certainly can happen. Now, it's common to have a little bit of blood in the tube in the first day or two. That's not that big of a deal and usually it will stop. So we usually just wash, but we flush the drain with saline during that time to prevent the drain from clogging from these blood clots. The other complication I kind of mentioned before is like when you go in and do a procedure, there is a chance that the patient may become septic. And that's because if he has bacteria in the bile, when you put drains and tubes, that bacteria can go into the bloodstream and temporarily the patient can become worse. He can have a high fever, sometimes he have chills, sometimes the blood pressure may drop, but that's usually temporary and will improve in a few hours. And another complication would be some type of perforation, but that's really, really rare. It's also not common, but it's important to know that the pancreatic duct, the duct that is draining the pancreatic juices, often comes out together with the bile duct in the ampulla of vector. So it's more common when you do ARCP actually because they're injecting retrograde, but also when we're doing biliary interventions, there is a risk of pancreatitis. It usually resolves itself, but it's manifested sometimes with some abdominal pain and elevated pancreatic enzymes. Now what to expect after the procedure? The biliary drains are usually attached to the skin with a small suture. They're we use to prevent uh, you from accidentally removing the tube. The site can often be a little bit irritated. That's normal for a few days afterwards. And some leakage of bile may also be normal, a small amount. So of course, if there is a lot of bile draining, that may indicate that the tube is blocked or was dislodged and some of the side holes are outside of the liver and we need to check. But a small amount, a few drops, little bit getting the gauze around wet, that's normal. It's also normal to have some pain in the procedure site, which can last a few days. Sometimes some patients may require some pain medication and you need to let us know. Of course, if you're having a lot of pain, we wanna evaluate making sure you don't have a bleeding or another complication related to this, like pancreatitis. So you need to let us know if you're having a lot of pain. But usually the pain subsides and after a few days or you know, a week, you shouldn't, you shouldn't have any pain. The key for taking care of the procedure site is to keep it clean and dry. And yes, you can take a shower with the biliary drains and I 
don't worry if they get wet during the shower that's totally fine as long as after the shower make sure you dry and then put another bandage i prefer to avoid complicated bandages that sometimes nurses try to put on it i prefer just to use a four inch pad that you can buy at any pharmacy or even on amazon and I think they should be changed pretty much every day. As far as the bio drainage, you should expect continuous drainage of the bio. You should expect anywhere from 100 cc's to even a liter. If the drainage completely stops, that may be a problem. It may indicate that the tube is completely blocked. For that reason, we usually recommend flushing these biliary drains once a day. You should use a 10 cc saline syringe that can be bought at pharmacies with a prescription. And usually the way it's done is you clean where the site that you're gonna inject. We usually put these devices there, are little flushing adapters. So you clean where you're gonna inject, then connect the syringe. You then close the clamp and inject five cc's of saline. That way the saline will be going towards the patient. You then open the clamp and inject another five cc's to clean the tubing that's going to the bag. After flushing, you have to make sure that you leave the clamp open so it can keep draining. But if it, if it stopped draining and you flushed and still not draining anything, you need to contact us to see what the problem is, if the tube is dislodged or is blocked. Now, it's not something that you need to call in the middle of the night, but I would call first thing in the morning by the next day and we'll get you seen almost right away. As far as the bags, I recommend them to be changed every week. You can buy bags on any pharmacy or you can buy online. Just Google biliary drain bags or put on Amazon and they're not super expensive and can be changed every day. To change it, it's a pretty easy system. You just screw in and screw out. It's the same thing of any screw, righty tidy, lefty loosey. You can also trim the length of the bag tube by cutting the tube and then connecting to a new adapter. Now, the other symptom that you need to watch for is if you develop a fever. If you develop a fever, don't wait around, go to the ER and gives us a call. It could be that the tube is blocked and infected, and that can be very dangerous since the patients can become septic. Now, essentially, you also need to stay hydrated because you're losing a significant amount of fluids through the biliary drain. So make sure you drink plenty of fluids to stay hydrated. And also, obviously, listen to your body. And if something doesn't look right, let us know and we'll be happy to see you and troubleshoot.